everybody. I'm Evie Roberts, and this is my podcast, Talking in the Dark. Welcome. The aim of this podcast is to raise awareness about blindness, visual impairment, and disability in general, in a happy and light-hearted way. For those of you that don't know, I am blind. I was born with a condition called bilateral anophthalmia. Try spelling that one. It basically means that when I was born, my eyes didn't develop properly. So I wear prosthetics instead. The goal of this podcast is to remove some of the stigma and stereotypes around disabilities, whilst also having fun at the same time. Each week, I will be interviewing people from all walks of life including some with hidden or physical disabilities like mine, and getting to know a little bit more about them and the lives they lead. This week, I am very excited to tell you that I will be talking to Scottish Labour MSP and first permanent wheelchair user to be elected in the Scottish Parliament, Pam Duncan Glancy. My name is Evie Roberts, and this is my podcast, Talking in the Dark. Welcome. Hi Pam, how are you? Hi Evie, I'm doing well, thank you. How are you? I'm really good, thank you. How's your day been? I'm busy but but interesting. So I've had some casework, I've been out to visit people's houses to, to have a look at some issues they're having um, and I've been catching up with some papers that I need to prepare for Parliament this week. So yeah, bit of a mix but good one, a good day. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it sounds busy. I mean, do you have a lot of days like that? Do you have a lot of days that are kind of a whole mix of things? Yeah, so I would say no two days are the same um, in this job. It's it's surprised me. Um, so there are some constants and some similarities. So, for example, Wednesday mornings, I'm always in committee. Um, Thursday afternoon at 12, there's always FNQs. And there's a various different times throughout the week where... Um, debates happen in Parliament and where we're all required to vote. But beyond that, then much of it is is um, flexible after that. And when I say flexible, I mean um, available but used. There's very little time that is not used. Right. OK. Yeah, it, it sounds like it. I mean, do you like that? Do you like that, you know, you never really know what's coming next? So when I started this job, one of the things I said to my team who I put in place as quickly as I could get in place, and I, I've never been a politician before, I've never been elected, um, to represent people and so um, I really didn't know what to expect um, and in the first sort of week I was like right let's get a strategy um, as to what we're going to do, how we're going to put processes in place to deal with emails, to deal with responses, to work on campaigns and I'm not joking like within one week that was <laughs> uh, that was all thrown up in the air because um, everything is so different. So I'm learning now to live with um, the fast pace and um, slightly the frustration, a slight frustration of mine though Evie is that the job is fast paced, but change is glacial. And that really frustrates me because I, I want to see change a lot faster than I see it, particularly for my constituents, in fact, mainly for my constituents. Um, and it's just glacial. It just takes so long to do it. Yet the job feels like you're running about a, half, a million miles an hour. Yeah, I, I totally get that. I mean, do you think that because it's so fast, fast paced do you think that's kind of taught you to go with the flow a little bit more than possibly before you got this job yeah um I'm a control freak and um, my office manager will tell you that so when he's trying to manage my diary and 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 sort my inbox and stuff he'll see me sneaking in and putting things in and taking things out and (laughs) and replying and he'll say to me you can't keep up with this you have to do the things I have to sort the things (laughs) so um that's that's how that's the division of labor really I, I I turn up where and when I'm told to be um, obviously, I set a sort of strategy and I set a kind of this is what I want to do. These are the people I want to be speaking in the meeting and um, and this is how I want to semi-structure my week. But in general, yeah, I just have to sort of start every week with a look at the diary in the week ahead and hope that it doesn't change too much from one day to the next. Fair enough. Now, I know that like me, you have a disability. So to begin with, could you tell me a little bit about your disability? Yeah, so I was diagnosed with juvenile chronic arthritis when I was 18 months old. Um, It was a particularly aggressive form of arthritis, which meant that by the age of five, I was using a wheelchair. And if someone was diagnosed today with that condition, there are a lot more options available to them. So there are a lot more drugs available. 
that that we know now can stop the disease in its in its tracks to an extent, or it can at least hold it back a bit. So many people who um, are diagnosed with arthritis would have a bit of a different path than I would have had. Um, they, so they still have it; it still exists. It still causes extreme um, pain and, and is is very debilitating and disabling. But within you know three and a half years, four years, I wasn't able to walk. I wasn't able to stand up, and I was in a wheelchair. And so um, that's really meant that since about the age of five, I've I've relied on on a wheelchair my my whole life. And um, when I was thirteen. I had some operations um, in my hips and some, uh, it wasn't an operation, I had on my knees, but it was, I got an anaesthetic um, where they would like straighten them and then put them in casts and then wake me back up after they'd done it. Um, and partly because it was just too sore to do when you're awake. So I had had a good few of them um, to try and um, make, make my legs um, a wee bit more um, functional, I guess. And after that, um, I was six months in hospital uh, and after that, I was able to stand and take a few steps, so I can I can walk about a little bit, and um, only really inside and only in for short spaces. Like I couldn't really I, walk from much further than one room to the next, you know. And I've got to have someone holding me because my balance is pretty awful. But that intervention when I was thirteen was life changing because at the time I couldn't couldn't stand up to transfer, and because my arthritis affects all the joints in my body, I couldn't use my arms to transfer. So I was being carried about by my mum or my dad or my sister, um, who's younger than me, and uh, or my friends and 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 staff at school who were there to support me. And obviously that's getting difficult when you're 13. But by the time you're like a fully grown adult, I'm still quite small, but nonetheless, by the time you're a fully grown adult, it's not really practical for people to be lifting you about. So that intervention I had that meant I could, at the very least, take a few steps and transfer really changed my life. But it also changed how I view health service and how I view hospitals and I'm one of these really strange people that love hospitals um, because I'm in them quite a lot um, but yeah so that's that's what my condition is and that's largely how it's kind of affected affected me medical views. Right okay I mean gosh it sounds like you've been through a lot but yeah I can totally imagine that that intervention would have been such an important sort of factor of your life um, yeah, yeah. Now, we've talked a little bit about the fact that you are a member of the Scottish Parliament. So could you tell me a little bit about your role and what it entails? So I am elected as a member of the Scottish Parliament to represent the Glasgow region. And I'm also the Shadow Cabinet Secretary for Education. And so I have kind of, it's almost like having two jobs. um, And uh, two jobs that could probably require 48 hours a day <laughs> um, between them. So as, as a Glasgow representative, it's my job to um, represent the, the interests of the people of Glasgow. And so um, I do that by um, having regular surgeries, keeping in touch with um, the, the people in the, in the region by doing regular door knocking to make sure that people know I'm available and if they need anything, they can come and speak to me. I also look at some of the decisions that are taken about Glasgow and how it affects them. So if the budget... Um, for the council, for example, I'm particularly concerned about the budget for the council just now. I'm very concerned about the budget for the integrated joint board, um, and so I would, you know, try my very best to intervene and ask the government to to make different choices and decisions because some of those decisions are going to be particularly um, bad for for people in Glasgow. So you kind of spend a bit of time on one to one casework where you pick up people's concerns and you represent them to the organisations that are supposed to. Um, serve them effectively and then try and make things better for them and then there's a more systemic approach as well which is a bit more about the, the kind of looking at what what Glasgow gets as its fair share of um, what what it should get in terms of money but also in terms of services what's the health service like in in Glasgow what's community care like what's education like are we served well by transport all these questions um, and do my best to intervene to improve them when I can um, and then as a shadow cabinet secretary for education uh, I sit on the Education, Children and Young People's Committee, spend um, a good three, four or five hours um, in committee sessions every Wednesday morning, and um, usually taking evidence on issues that are pertinent. Um, we've got a live inquiry just now looking at um, support for pupils with additional support needs. And um, that's fascinating. Um, and there's a lot, I have a huge interest in that um, for obvious reasons. But also there's a whole host of problems um, that really do need addressed. So um, I love committees. I actually think that's probably my favourite part of the job. That and then and um, my surgeries because I really like meeting people. Um, so yeah, there's there's two parts of it. And then of course there's the the bit where you um you 
you as an elected representative have to change or or influence the law. So probably one of the most important things, and in fact, the unique thing that I as a legislator can do that other people can't, and and all legislators can do, is of course change the law. And so that's um, a real privilege to be able to try and do that. And I try where I can, as best I can, to influence all the legislation that I think needs to change to improve the lives of people who live in Glasgow, to improve disabled people's lives, and also to improve education across the country. Um, So I've got surgeries, um, I've got door knocking when I go around and meet people in the community. I go and visit um, organisations to hear about what they do. And I've got researchers who look at what's going on in Glasgow and how, um, and also in education to see how things are. And then I, I ask questions of government. Right. Okay. Gosh, it sounds like you've got a lot on your plate then. But I mean, you know, kind of what sparked your interest in, in politics? Um. So initially, I'd say I, I kind of ended up here by accident, not design. Um, but when I went to uni, um, a, a good friend of mine, um, Kelly, uh, who had a visual impairment, um, actually, she she approached me in, in the canteen one day in the cafe area in Stirling Uni when I was studying and she came in and she said to me, hello, uh, my name's Kelly, um, we're looking for a disabled person to join the Students' Representative Council and you look like you might fit the bill. Uh, you might fit the bill. So to which I kind of said, yeah, well spotted. Um, Thank you. Do you know, I'm, I'm here to get my degree. I want to study. I'm studying psychology. I want to come study it and come out the other end as a psychologist. Representation has not really been something I'm particularly keen in or, you know, I've not thought about it. She said, I'll give it a shot. I think you'd be good at it. And she didn't know much about me at the time. She took a punt. And um, I went along to the first meeting. And um, at that moment in time, I realised that if I hadn't been in that room, um, then there wouldn't have been someone there that would have advocated for disabled people's issues that night. Um, so they were looking to redesign the, the union, the student union, and part of that was about having a lift um, in it, and the lift would be accessed by key only, which I said, why are disabled people locked out? You know, why Why can't, why is the lift locked? <laughs> like, don't understand this. Um, and I realised that not through any malice or ill intent, but just generally by not being in the room, disabled people probably wouldn't have been represented, and that particular issue would never have been raised. And so from then on, I thought, I, I realised that, learned very, very quickly, and easily, it was an easy lesson. Um, that representation matters and so from then on I wanted to represent people. Right okay I mean I suppose then would you say that a lot of your interest in politics was down to your friend and I guess I wonder if it wasn't down to your friend do you think you would have got into politics at all? Um, I think there are a number of people who were around in my life at that time that probably would have edged me this direction but Kelly's certainly the person whose question stands out, and and it definitely to make like that moment is is what I is when I realised that I, I quite enjoyed representation. Um, but there, I mean, there were other people in my life that were involved in the student union and in, and, and indeed in politics with a capital P. Um, you know, they were members of parties and largely the Labour Party at the time, um, and still are. And so they probably would have edged me that direction anyway. And I think now that I'm in it, I feel like I would have naturally always probably progressed here because. I've got a burning desire to fight for people's rights and never really been satisfied until I've been able to do it. Right. Okay. But yeah, you mentioned about that disabled representation and I totally agree with you. I think that's such an important thing. And I think it's just about, um, obviously you've mentioned that if you weren't, if you hadn't been in the room at the time, you know, issues wouldn't have been resolved and things like that. So I think it's so important to especially kind of ask people with disabilities or people from different walks of life what issues they face I think it's just important to include everyone and talk to everyone about the issues that they face so you know we've all kind of got an equal right really definitely and we know that disabled people women black minority ethnic people LGBT people are not yet represented in the decision making forums across the country in the way that they should be so there's a lot of work that needs to be done um, and I'm really clear, you know, I, I, I represent Glasgow and everyone who lives here, whether they're disabled or not. But I'm also quite happy to be the person that says I, I'm also proud to represent disabled people where I can as well. Because, you know, I've been in very many rooms where I've thought if it wasn't me, then who would it be that would be asking these questions? So I think it's really important. Yeah, definitely. I think you always need someone to ask, really, so you can get a, a, a kind of full idea of what's going on at at a certain point um 
Now, I believe you are the first permanent wheelchair user to be elected. Um, as a disabled candidate, how was the election experience for you? Um, really difficult. Uh, I think in a, standing in an election is hard for anyone, right? Um, and I mean that from any party. It's not an easy thing to do. And and I understand why why public perception of politics is is in the place it's in, which is bluntly not a good place. Um, but it's hard work. And I fundamentally believe that most people who get into politics do it because they believe in public service. And the, the campaign to get there in the first place, there are only 129 people in this position in Scotland. And so your odds, odds are against you anyway. And then you stack up some other odds, like being a, a woman or being in a wheelchair, um, or you know, you know, I could I could list loads as, as as I'm sure you know. And all of that makes it a little bit more difficult. So just like getting out and about and it's is difficult. Uh, I, I rely on social care, being able to meet the demands of a campaign that genuinely does expect you to be available 24-7. And and I mean I mean 24-7. There is like anything that you that you say, if your diary is bursting at the seams and you say, I need a break at that point, it's not always looked upon very favorably because people expect you to serve them because you represent them. And and I get that. I really get it. But it does put an inordinate amount of pressure on on people, and in, and that pressure is even more acute during a short campaign. Um, but having said that, it was I had the time of my life. Like I love, I love the buzz of a campaign, and um, I love the the feeling that you get when um, you, you have a whole load of activists who are willing to come out and knock a door on your behalf. And um, I love the feeling that you get when you speak to people and they believe in you. Um, and they believe that you can change something for them and that they believe it to the extent that they're prepared to vote for you. Um, all of that is is really, really exciting. So it was hard. It was long hours. It is for everyone. I'm not pretending it's not difficult for anyone else. Um, as a disabled person, you've got the barriers you experience on a daily basis on top of unique ones in a campaign, um, like just being able to, to keep the hours you need to keep to Get in and out of buildings um, can be difficult um, in a wheelchair, as you might imagine. So some of that, you know, there are physical um, difficulties. But the key to it, um, just some conscious people listening to this, um, I, I want to encourage them to do it because whilst I say it was difficult, um, it's it's doable, and and I want more people to do it. The key is to build a really strong, a really really strong team, because where I couldn't climb the stairs of a tenement to knock someone's door, I knew I had a, an army of incredible volunteers who were prepared to climb those stairs and, and sell sell me on a doorstep um, or sell Scottish Labour at the time um, as well on a doorstep. And so that's really important to have a team of people around you who understand you, who know what you need, who know what you what you want and who are prepared to go out and do it in your head. Yeah, totally. Do you know, I've talked to um, several people from kind of all walks of life and they've all said that that support network, that team is really, really important. I think that it's quite difficult to get to a place where you want to be if you don't have people around you to help you out. Um, and so it's interesting you say that because I'll, I've had a lot of people say that and I totally agree with them. It's so important um, to, like you said, even just have people who believe in you and believe you can do it. That's a massive step in itself. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I was really, really lucky because my party were really supportive as well. So there were activists who were um, campaigning, um, yes, for Scottish Labour and yes, for, for me, um, because they, they they believed in in, in what I was offering. Um, but my party were also incredible and, and they really, really, really recognised the help that I needed and did everything they possibly could to do that. Um, and I need to, every time I say this, I try and remember to to give them a shout out because Anas's support, Anas Sarwar, who's the leader of the Scottish Labour Party, um, his support was outstanding. And he recognised and still recognises that people from different backgrounds need some additional support in order to be able to um, access politics on a level playing field. And, and he was incredible as a support for that. And without him, I wouldn't have had the support I did in the end. Um, so, yeah, that really matters as well. So leadership and teamship are probably two of the most important things. Yeah, absolutely. You mentioned earlier that kind of pressure that you get when you're taking part in a campaign. Um, I mean, you say you love the buzz of a campaign, but how how do you kind of cope with that pressure? And do you have any sort of coping mechanisms that you use if it sort of gets too much? Mm. You need to have people around you in your close family and friends circle 
who recognise when you need a break and who you trust understand the importance of the project and why you're dedicating as much time as you are because you need to know that when they say you need a break that they're not just saying it because they don't believe they, they don't they don't get the importance of not taking a break you need you need people around you who get how important it is who know how much you want it but who also know that you can't pour from an empty cup yeah definitely um yeah I think it is really important to have those people who recognize when it's all getting too much and who will tell you like look you need a you need a break here you know you need to step back a little bit so what kind of issues do you find that the disabled community face so in just one day I have spoken to most of my the most of the casework I've been doing uh, today has been about disabled people and in one day, um, we've identified social care shortages, increases in social care charges, lack of accessible housing, and problems getting um, support at school for pupils with autism. And that's just in one day. Um, and those are all different, like different people. So housing, social care, education for children and young people with, um, who are disabled, and um, access to health care and, and, and social care yeah are the are the key issues i think and transport is also a big problem but it's unsurprisingly the one that comes second to most people's other problems and the reason that i'm not surprised about that is because you only need transport to get out of your house in the first place and if you're not if you're not in an accessible house and you're not having enough social care chances are you don't even know that transport isn't accessible because you've not you've not been able to get out to it so yeah housing health and social care education and transport all the issues that disabled people face. Right, okay. Yeah, I guess it is a bit like a chain reaction, isn't it? They all kind of, all those issues kind of connect in some way. And if you can't resolve one, there's no way you're going to resolve another because they all do connect. But would you say that your own sort of experiences and challenges have helped to shape your approach? Yeah, so I uh, I often say, and and I think you'll get this, Evie, but disabled people are innovative by design. Mm -hmm. We have to be, because we have to innovate sometimes just to get out of bed in the morning and um, just to go to the shop. We have to be innovative um, in some situations. And that has given me the opportunity to, I think, be adaptable, be a relentless, having a relentless focus on problem solving, um, but also understanding the interconnectedness of when one problem causes another and how it relates to it. And I've been able to apply that level of, I guess, disadvantage in my life to other people's circumstances, whether or not they're disabled, and really hone my own strategic skills that, that mean I'm able to see the bigger picture in most situations. And that's because I've kind of had to learn how to see the bigger picture in most situations because I had no choice. Um, and so I think that is a really useful trait in someone who represents people. Yeah, totally. And I can completely relate to what you're saying about being innovative. I think you've got to be, you've you've got to kind of be creative because when you have a disability, not everything is as easy as an able-bodied person would think it is. You have to find different ways of sometimes just doing everyday tasks. So you've got to be creative. And I think as well, you've got to be so resilient. And like you said, you've got to know how to problem solve. And I think for me, I think if I wasn't visually impaired, I wouldn't, I don't think I'd be as resilient as I am. I don't, I don't know about you. What, what do you think? I, I totally agree. Words that I, um, that I read in a book by Alistair Campbell, actually, um, and the book is called, uh, But What Can I Do? And it's intended to have um, an emphasis on, but what can I do? Or, but what can I do? So the emphasis on but or I um, implying um, both both helplessness and also an eagerness to change things. Anyway, it's, it's a good book. It's worth a read. Um, but there's a line in that where he says he wants to create a new word in the um, Oxford Dictionary called perseverance. And he believes that anyone who gets into politics needs to have perseverance in abundance. And I believe that that is the trait that separates disabled people from other people in politics, because perseverance is a cross between perseverance and resilience. And I think both of those things, when they come together, um, are a bit of a dream team. But they also, I mean, they take their toll, you know, they, like it's, it's hard work being resilient and 
you know, persevering all the time. And it gets tiring from from my point of view. That's why I wanted to do it to represent people because I know how tiring I, I know how tired I was. So now I want to be able to do it for not just one person at a time, but I want to be able to do it for a whole group of people or a whole region of people, for example, in Glasgow, and um, to try and take the project management aspect of the fight that's in their life off of them and be the person that perseveres and be the person that's resilient. Yeah, I completely understand that. So what do you hope to achieve whilst being a member of the Scottish Parliament? Um, <laughs> just getting from day to day at this point. <laughs> um, it's, uh, I, I really, really hope that I can change the lives of people who live in Glasgow. I'd like to think that Glasgow is a more accessible, um, affordable and available place for people who live in it and want to come to it by the time I finish my, my tenure. Um, or at least my first tenure in 2026. Um, I'd like to think I leave I leave the Glasgow region in a more accessible, available and, and affordable place to be. Um, and my contribution to that is to relentlessly focus on um, access, to relentlessly focus on um, reducing social care charges. I'd, I'd like to see them ended. I've been campaigning for that um, for years. Um, I'd like to see our subway system be far more accessible than it is now. I'd like to see our buses be more accessible than they are now. I think the franchising opportunity that was announced last week is helpful for that. Um, I'd like to make sure that we built more houses that were accessible for people in wheelchairs. Um, and I'd like to make sure that things like um, the LEZ and what we do with our town centre makes Glasgow available and accessible for everyone. Um, and so we need to be careful about what policies we, we, we choose to do that. I'd also like Glasgow um, to, to reclaim its place um, as the place where people come to enjoy the arts and culture. And, and, you know, it wasn't in my lifetime, probably not in yours, Evie, but in my lifetime, Glasgow won the city of culture. Um, yet we're in a situation right now where our culture sector is really struggling, um, partly because of some of the decisions the council have taken around parking charges in the evening or um, the LEZ or... And various different decisions that have taken, which have made the nighttime economy really struggle. And partly because the um, access to the arts is just not funded in the way that it really should be and not, not valued. So I'd like to think that I could do something to shift the dial on that before I finish. Right. OK. Do you know what? I'm sure that you will be able to accomplish that. Um, I mean, you you seem so incredible. So I have almost no doubt that you will be able to accomplish all of that, to be honest with you. Oh, well, thank you. That like, That's really, really kind. And like hearing people like you say that you have um, faith, faith in people like me really, really, um, really means a lot, Evie. So thank you. I appreciate that. And I'll, I'll do everything every day as best I can to make sure I earn that faith. Oh, you totally are already. You don't have to worry about that. Now, I am a cane user. I'm totally blind and I'm a cane user. And pavement parking is a bit of an issue. And I know it's a sort of hot topic among the yes. disabled community. Um, now, I believe that in Scotland, the Transport Scotland Act 2019, among other things, banned pavement parking. And I know that this is now sort of beginning to be implemented. So can you please tell me a bit more about that? So one of the first things I did when I got elected was um, I, I kind of took a walk around some of the streets, particularly Sucky Hall Street and, the, and just after the Avenues project had kind of come to completion. Um, with a group of people who were visually impaired, mm. um, a mix of cane users and guide dog users, um, to see how inaccessible Glasgow really was for them. Part of that included doing a walk around um, with guide dog users um, to, to look at pavement parking and the, and the issues that it, that it brought. And now, far aside um, from the, the, just the, the kind of general concern, which means there's not enough space on the, the pavement to pass, it also really confused guide dogs and someone with a cane wouldn't necessarily expect that there was a car in front of them on the pavement. So all of that meant that you were effectively diverting visually impaired people off of what is what would be the safe path into potentially oncoming traffic. And because of guide dogs training, um, they, 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 would, they wouldn't take you onto a road if they didn't think it was safe to cross. So they would just stop because they knew they would know they weren't at a safe crossing because they wouldn't have the underfoot thing to let them know that that's where they are um, and all the other cues that would give them uh, an indication that it would be safe to cross. So that just kind of meant a dog would stop. So that then you're left with a situation where the visually impaired person's just not really sure what's going on. And the only option they have is to find somewhere where there's enough room for them to pass, which could well be on the road 
for both them and a guide dog. And then, you know, similar situation for people in wheelchairs. So I asked the government several times, um, twice, I think, um, six months apart, what are you doing to encourage councils to implement this? And they said, oh, they, they could be implementing it, but they weren't giving them any funding. They weren't really giving them any enforcement to do it. So it was really coming down to whether councils were prepared to do it or not. And I'm really pleased to say that um, Edinburgh has, you know, very recently um, begun to implement that and put in place mechanisms to enforce it. Um, but I don't know that Glasgow's kind of followed suit yet. So that's something that I'm trying to trying to push. Right. OK. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's brilliant that it's beginning to be implemented, I think it does need to be sort of implemented everywhere really because it is such yeah. a big issue and it does need to be resolved um but it's brilliant that those first steps are being taken because it is really just about taking those first steps that's sometimes the biggest thing yeah and um, trying to get them into a position where they do it like and, and say you've got a responsibility to do this so hopefully more more councils will follow suit Yes, hopefully. I'm sure they will. So what would you say has been your proudest moment in your life so far? Well, um, probably getting the day I got elected to the Scottish Parliament. I don't think I'll ever forget it. Um, I remember exactly what happened. I remember sitting in a room at the back of the Emirates Stadium in the dark because they were projecting the, the ballot results onto a screen because there was only a few of us allowed to look at it. We couldn't huddle around the ballots because it was covid um, so it was projected onto a screen. And I remember quickly trying to work out the maths as to whether the, the fourth person on the list for Scottish Labour, who was me, was, was going to get elected or not. And uh, I could see other people getting in and getting in. And I was, so I was the last person to be elected in the Glasgow region. Um, and Anas was behind me at the time. And he has obviously sat through more of these than I have. So he was quicker to the conclusion, probably only by a few seconds, but nonetheless, he beat me to it. Um, so he had seen that I'd been elected before I had clocked that I'd been elected. And then the announcement comes after. Um, and so in the dark, standing at the side of me, and I just feels this little squeeze on my shoulder. He leant forward and he said, you've done it. I told you you'd do it. And at that point, I realised, God, I've been elected. Um, I still get goosebumps when I describe the moment. Um, and then the returning officer came over and said, you've been elected. Um, congratulations. And I turned around and I was like literally sobbing with joy, tears of joy. And and I said, Radio Clyde, what do an interview? And I was like, oh my God, but I'm crying. And he was like, yeah, but you, the job starts now. On you go, wipe your eyes, <laughs> dry your tears, <laughs> get on the radio, you know? Um, and so I did, and I did my interview. And um, and then I, I, did, I did a bit with the BBC. And then about half an hour, 45 minutes later, I left the building, got in my van and sat in the back of my van in my wheelchair and just couldn't believe it. I just couldn't believe it. And so that moment in the back of the van was probably the last sort of calm moment when I realized my life would, was, was normal. From then on, it just kind of got swept away in, wow. in, a, in a really good, good, good way. But like, I mean, nothing was normal from that moment on. <laughs> my gosh. Yeah. I mean, that sounds absolutely incredible. Um, you know, just listening to you describe that, it's amazing. And I very much doubt that you will ever forget that day and like the feelings that you felt on that day. I think that's something that's probably going to stick with you forever. Oh, I'm sure of it. I'm absolutely sure of it. I've got the photo that was taken just as it happened. I've got it framed in my office in Parliament. Oh, I love that. I, I would imagine that's going to be something you really treasure in the future as well. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. And if you ever get a chance to come to Parliament, I'd happily host you so you can come and can come and have a look around. Oh, well, thank you. Well, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. You are absolutely amazing. Um, the work you're doing is incredible and very much needed. And it's been such a privilege to talk to you. So thank you so much. Thank you. It's been really, really great to, to chat with you, Evie. Um, I've done a few podcasts in my time and I have to say you're one of the best interviews I've ever had. Oh, thank you. Genuinely. That yeah, means genuinely. I really enjoyed it. You made it very natural. It felt like it, it was it was really nice. Thank you. Thank you. Oh my gosh. That means so much. Cause I have to admit, sometimes I think as an interviewee, you feel a little bit self-conscious. You don't really know how you're doing. You don't really know if you're good or not. So thank you. That really does mean a lot. No, you are. You're brilliant. Oh, thank you. And thank you to my audience for listening. And I will see you all next time.